Shalom. So now we are finally arriving at the end of the book of, uh, of um, Numbers, Bamidbar. And soon we're going to read together the same parasha. Next week we will start together with the parasha of uh, Deuteronomy, the first one. So Mas E is the journeys. It's number 31 till the end of the book. And the after is the second of punishment, what is so-called leading to the next uh, after all who are going to be one of blessings until Rosh Hashanah. And uh, it's Jeremiah 2, 4, 28 and 3, verse 4. These are the journeys, Masse, of the children of Israel who went out of the land of Egypt by their armies until the hand of Moses and Aaron. So each, each parasha uh, takes his name from one of the keywords of the verses. Journeys is Mas'e, Mas'e. So if we browse the parasha, it goes like this. There are 42 steps that are recorded in the wilderness. The commandments to cleanse the country from idolatry. The limits of the land of Canaan. Attribution of cities to the Levites. Cities of refuge. And one more time, the Tzelofrat's daughters allowed to marry within their tribes. So the end of the book of Numbers lists the various stops of the son of Israel in the wilderness. The division and <clears throat> of the land is closed. The new generation is about to enter the promised land, purified. The troops are preparing and the Almighty refuse the 40 years spent in a hostile environment and the joys, the hardships experimented by the people trials and mercies towards the young generation now ready to take possession of their inheritance. Most commentators follow Rashi's teaching that there were 42 stops, journeys, and that the people stayed 19 years in Kadesh. The Midrash Tan Roma suggests another reason for the detailed account of the stops of the son of Israel by giving a parable. It may be compared to a king who had a sick son. He took him from one place to the next in search of a suitable cure. When they were on their way back home, the father began to recount all the travels. And he said, here we slept, here we were cold, remember? Here your head hurt, and so on and so forth. So this makes us understand that the Israelites were not nomads randomly wandering in the desert, despite all the many stops that they did. They spent long, peaceful times without lacking anything. These recorded stops were not the result of a hazardous wandering, as the name, the Arabic name for the desert is wilderness of wanderings. No, it has nothing to do with it. It is rather the fruit of a divine will Teaching, wanted to teach and to guide his children step by steps, leading them forward in order for them to understand the deep and profound message he wanted to convey to them. Nothing is random in the Torah. The Torah is a book of instruction. One more time I say it, it's not a book of laws, instruction. Torah comes from the root to instruct, to teach. Each of the places represented a specific uh, location and, and situation. For instance, we have some words like in the text, like Shafer and Mitkap. So Shafer speaks of beauty. Shafer is beautiful. Mitka comes from the root Matok, which is sweet and pleasant. While you have other stops like Harada and Dovka that speak of terror and attack. So in fact, those 42 journeys in all the Baal Shem Tov explain that they exist in the life of every human being from the moment of his birth until the day of death. When a person is born and leaves the womb, that corresponds to the exodus from Egypt. Afterwards, all the journey in life from one place to another until he reaches the supernal land of life, which is the world to come represented here by the land of Israel. The tradition sees an analogy between the deliverance from Egypt and the future redemption that will gather all the people. This time, the people will be saved from the desert of the nations from which Hashem will bring back his people. We can read in Ezekiel 34 verse 13, And I will bring them out, Otsetim, from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them to the land. 
their own land. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, in the valleys and in inhabited places of the country. And this prophecy is being fully party because we are now in Israel living in the mountains of Israel, according to Ezekiel 36. Number 32 says, it uses the same word that in Ezekiel. These are the journeys of the children of Israel who went out of the land of Egypt by their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now Moses brought down the starting points of their journeys, Motsayim, at the commandment of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their starting points, Motsayim. The word is the same. Translation is different, but it's still Motsayim, the same word. And the first word in the verse of Numbers, their journey Motsayim, refers to the first deliverance from Egypt, while the second one refers to the final deliverance from the nations. Moreover, the initials in that verse, verse 1, these are the journeys of the children of Israel, Elle Ma'ase Bne Israel, allude to the various exiles that Israel would experience before the final redemption. The initial of each of these words, Elle is Aleph, like Adom, Edom, Edom means the exile from Edom, the western wild Rome. Ma'ase Mem refers to the Med, Madiani, the Persian. Bne Bet refers to Babylon, Babylonian exile, while the Yud refers to the spiritual exile, the deep exile of Yavan, that is Greece. For that one, which was one of the most serious ones, I really encourage you to watch our video on Hanukkah and to get the book on Hanukkah. The theme of the exile is also found in our parasha, with the commandments to create six cities of refuge, we'll see it later. And we will understand that the coming out of Egypt foreshadows the final redemption and the entrance to the promised land with Messiah. So talking about the 42 journeys, the Torah shows us that all those journeys were organized by Hashem himself. Each step was guided by his hand in order to sanctify the people, to give them maturity, to help them to mature and to understand what was at stake to enter the promised land. So to understand this, let us pure, clarify, um, there is a spiritual distinction between the land of Israel and the rest of the world, as well as in as the teaching that in the Messiah, it, it says in, in, um, in Jewish sources that the Messianic, in the Messianic era, the land of Israel is destined to spread of, all over the world, over the entire world. It is in Yalkut Shmoni. It means that the word in general, it will attain the spiritual level that Israel enjoys today. By the same way, Israel will then itself rise to the superior level of the holy city, that is Jerusalem, that will in turn be elevated to the super level of the heavenly Jerusalem. It, you know, this is something as we, we could say that it is um, like a, a kind of rapture. Not the, the, the rapture, you know, that you will be like we can see in the Hollywood movie where people are leaving only, only the, their socks on the siege of the plane. Not that kind of rapture, but a spiritual elevation from level to level. That will be this rapture. And the Messianic Age, in fact, see an elevation of the entire universe including all the spiritual realms. So this is a very important concept to understand, to grasp. We are going to be more elevated, more aware of the spiritual things and more closer to the Lord. So we can deduct from that that the Torah was given by Moses, to Moses, by God, and everything it contains represents and speaks about his essence. It teaches in depth and it is indivisibly linked to the end time prophecy. The Torah is a total prophetic book. All the prophecies are not yet fulfilled, so it's a living book. And we can read in the last book of the prophets, that time in Malachi, remember the Torah of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgment, Chukimu Mishpatim, everything that is inside the Torah. Behold, I will send you Elijah before the Messiah. So we have to watch the Torah, to look in the Torah, to understand when Messiah will appear. According to tradition, 
The number of those tops, 42, correspond to the name, one of the name of God, that appear secretly in the verses of Genesis 1, 1, 2, 2, 3. Six letters for each of the seven days of creation, which makes 42, corresponding to the 42 journeys Mas'e listed at the end of our book. The Talmud teaches that this name, which has been lost to us, it is one of the attributes, divine attributes of God, is revealed to the humble and wise hearts. Why? Because we have to watch out, to be careful with God's name. We don't play or invent names. We have to be very, very careful and fearful and in awe before his greatness. We don't understand everything about the creation and about the creator. So it says that the 40 letter name is entrusted only to him who is pious, meek, middle-aged, free from bad temper, sober, not insistent on his rights. And he who knows it, it is heedful thereof and observes it in purity, he is beloved above and popular below, fair by man, and inherits towards this world and the world to come. Hashem signed the Torah with his name, one of his name, and as it appears in many numerous other passages. And all those who seek truth will find him. When we seek truth, we can get close to these attributes. When the list of all those are read at the synagogue, the reader doesn't take breaks because the name of God is included in those 42 journeys in the wilderness. And Talking about this, we have an allusion also at those mysterious names, and we can read it in Revelation 19. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. So it's not it's abnormal not to know all the names of God. He was clothed with the robe dipped in blood, and his name, that time we know this one, is called the Word of God. There is a process in every step. And there is a process even in our maturity, and it is necessary to go to this process to possess the land of Israel that represents the heavenly. And the various top place in the Torah describes all those different stages. So let's review some of them, not all of them, it's all this is in the in depth described in the studies of the Yeshiva, of the book of Numbers. So I'm just going to quote some of them. Ramses. Ramses is the coming out of Egypt. It's also the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Ragamatzot. It is a new era, a new beginning. The moon calendar is given now to the people of Israel. And Ramses is the beginning, 15 Nisan 2448, but it's also a point of non-return. Once out of Egypt, both physically and spiritually, with his, all these 49 degrees of impurity that we were saved from, we cannot go back to this. This is the same spiritually and physically. In 2 Peter 2, it says, For if, after they have escaped the pollution of the word throughout the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Yeshua Mashiach, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse from them than the beginning. We are not allowed to come back. Then Sukkot. Sukkot is the first campsite in the wilderness. It was named after the seven clouds of glory according to uh, Targum Yonatan, that surrounded the, the Son of Israel, because the, the clouds look like the Sukkot, the boots. Sukkot is also the prophetic end of the exile, when all Israel will be miraculously restored to celebrate the King of Kings in Jerusalem, as we can read in Zechariah 14, 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, Chag HaSukkot. And after this first step of salvation, Sukkot, the last step aims at the Messianic reign. There, the, the cloud of glory will reveal the Messiah to his people. Revelation 1, 7 Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. This is Zachariah. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. So this prophetic stop shows that the hand of Hashem has always been on his people to take care of them and to save a remnant to the end. And um, now we have Pi Achirot, Valley of Freedom. 
So it is written here in the verse Al Pi Arirot. While in the previous parasha in Beshalar, it was said Lifne Pi Arichot. So the words Al Pi Arichot, Al Pi can be can be read according to the word of Hashem. P is mouth, which says, according to the word of the Almighty, the Israelites were going to become free men. Hashem pronounced the word and freedom was granted. Let my people go to serve me, to serve me at a three days march in the desert to receive the Torah, which is a Torah of freedom, of liberty. Men and women of the whole world are called to become free by his word. And we can read in Psalm 107, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Mara, this is bitter. Mara is bitter in Hebrew. It is where God turned the bitter into sweet. After three days' walk, the Israelites arrived in Mara before undrinkable waters. So they were exhausted, desperate. They murmured and Hashem made a miracle. He taught Yoreu, but Yoreu is the same root than Torah, so the Torah is instruction, not law. Yoreu, I will teach you something you still do you know, though you still don't know. You probably think that to make water drinkable, one needs sweet plants. I will show you that I will sweeten bitterness with bitter wood. In Mara, Hashem taught the people to sweeten bitterness with bitter wood. Sweetness can come from bitterness and a difficult situation can bring a blessing. And this would evoke the suffering of Yeshua on the wood. It was painful, but so beneficial for the salvation of the whole world. And it's a model for us, like it says in 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. I thought some strange thing happened to you. It's a necessary pro process. We need to go through pain in order to, in, to experiment joy. We need to go to darkness in order to experiment light. Elim, it is about the 12 tribes like the 12 spring that water the 70 palm trees, representing the 70 nations of the world. Elim, the, the letters, they, they shape the same as Elohim, which is the name of God, the name of the natural rules. Elohim is the same numeral vacuum as Teva, nature. God wants to confirm to the children of Israel that he is above nature, above the natural law, and that they can be above it also if they obey his precepts by faith. And the link between the 12 springs and the 70 palm trees suggests another explanation. According to the Midrash, these 12 springs are the tribes, the 12 tribes, watering spiritually the 70 root nations that we find in Genesis 10, Parashat Noah. 12 tribes, like 12 apostle foundation of the Keilah, the assembly of God. And we read in Revelation 21, and she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on it, on them, which are the, the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. After reminder of those 42 stops, Hashem commands um, Moshe to do five things, to drive out the nations in the land, to share the land with the tribes, to divide it, to determine borders, to give cities to the Levites, to design, designate cities of refuge. Hashem commanded to destroy and drive out the seven nations that live in Canaan to avoid the idolatry. Canaan was like a bad clipot, husk, bad husk, the bad thing that surround the diamond, for instance. You need to remove them in order to see the diamond shine. Canaanite population were very deeply corrupted in idolatry and they, they were destined to be destroyed, removed. The word is pure and sharp. No impurity can dwell in the land of the Almighty. And we can read the same thing in Revelation 22. Blessed are those who do his commandments and his mitzvot, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practice lie. Only a bride that has been cleansed from Egypt can welcome a, gro a groom according to his rank. So we have to take Egypt out of us, the 49 degrees of impurity. For this, I send you back to the video on Pesach to take, to remove Egypt from ourselves. 
in Revelation 22 again, I, Yeshua, have sent my angel to testify to you the things in the, in the Keilot. I am the root and the offsprings of David, the bright and morning star. He is the Korav Yaakov, the, 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 the bright uh, star that has been prophesied by Balak, by Bilam. And the spirit and the bride say, come and let who him here say, come and let him who thirsts come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. So what is the key of happiness to dwell in Israel? We have the text in Deuteronomy 8.1 that tells us, obedience to the word of God, Torah. Every commandment, mitzvah, which is not the proper translation because mitzvah comes from from tzavta, which, which means a, a, like a, a team with God. Every commandment which has commanded you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the Lord swore to you, fathers. So, of course, in Israel, it's much easier to, to practice Torah. But Hashem has reserved a place for his bride who must take possession of it and dwell there in his time. The Jews today from the house of Judah have the duty to go up to Israel to make Aliyah and the time will come when Hashem will gather all Israel in Eretz Israel to reign with him. And we're going to read this passage to, taken from the, parasha, from the parasha Nitzavim in Deuteronomy, which is so prophetic, Deuteronomy 30. Now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among the nations where the Lord your God drives you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today. Is not The new generation is not even entering the promised land that is telling them that they will be exiled, but he will bring them back later, much, much later. You and your children, with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations, coming back, where the Lord your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you and from there he will bring you. Then the Lord your God will bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it. He will prosper you, multiply you more than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul that you may live. Also the Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you will again avoid, obey the voice of the Lord and do all his commandments which I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abound in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, and in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers if you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments, mitzvot, and his statutes, hokotav, which are written in the book of the Torah, and if or when, since you will you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So we can read in that text, among other things, that true circumcision of the heart is done by faith in Messiah and obedience to the Torah. That's a new birth. The gathering in Eretz Israel will take place at the sound of the heavenly shofar, as we can read in 1 Thessalonians and Matthew 24, that gathering all different prophecies. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shot, with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the shofar of God. And the dead in Messiah will rise first. Then he who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Then the sign of the man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send in angels with the great son of a shofar, and they will gather together his elects from the four winds, the same as in Deuteronomy, from one heaven to the other. All the prophecies are quoted, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Zechariah in these two passages. Why waiting for the glorious return of the sun? The land of Israel is divided between the tribes. This reveals that the place 
uh, where the divine presence longs to dwell is not limited to a geographical border. Indeed, we can see and we can read in our text that the borders vary according to the division and even go beyond any political conceptions. But I have to leave this for the studies in the yeshiva because it would take us forever. And it shows us that Israel extends far beyond his physical limits. That's in the studies of the yeshiva. Register, you will be very blessed by those studies. The cities of the Levit, Levites. The fourth commandment now given to Moses is to attribute cities to the Levites. These cities, they were residential places, they became the property of the Levites because they didn't have any, they didn't own any land in Eretz Israel. They were responsible to teach Torah to the people, in the temple and to the people. In Deuteronomy 33 it says, they shall teach Jacob your judgments, the Levites, and Israel your Torah. They should put incense before you and a whole burnt sacrifice on your altar. So serving God as he expects is an honor reserved for those who, like the Levites, set their lives and their families apart for the service of God. The Levites, they were exempted from the army because they were a special unit in the army of God. And among the 48 cities, six were also designated to be the cities of refuge. It was the fifth commandment given to Moses. In number 35, now among the cities which you will give to the Levites, you shall appoint six cities of refuge, Hare Amiklat, to which a manslayer may flee. And to this you shall add 42 cities. Three of the, the six cities were in, were in the other side of the Jordan. Tradition teaches that in future, Messiah will consecrate three more cities that belong to the three nations that had not been defeated yet, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, and the Kanmonites. Courts had to ensure that roads to the cities of refuge were well kept. What was it? It was about when somebody killed um, accidentally another man. It is a unique concept in the Torah. This guy, if he, it happened to him or this person, had to flee to one of them to be safe from the avenger of blood, meaning the close relative of the victim, and remain in this city of refuge until the death of the Kohen Gadol, the great sacrificator. In the Torah, Murder is an outrage to God himself and it requires the death penalty in return because the land must be redeemed from this soiling. We can read in Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. Bloodshed calls for revenge. A man's death affects him, but it also means the death of all his potential descendants that were created at the image of God. So causing the death of a creature of God is serious. And in number 35, we read, you shall not pollute the land where you are for blood defiles the land and no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed on it except by the blood of him who shed it. Therefore, do not defy the land which you inhabit. All bloodshed must be atoned for. The land had to be sanctified and cleansed for blood, either by, by execution, if it was in the case of a real murder, or by exile to a city of refuge, if it was accidentally, until the death of the sacrificator. So death penalty is biblical. The murderer has to atone for the life he took with his own life. The cities of refuge, they belong to the Levites who taught Torah. So the person who accidentally killed another one had to go there to stay there where teaching of the Torah was the main activity. Why? Because he spent like this the rest of his life in this shelter and the refuge of studying the divine commandments, wondering why these things happened to me. What did I generate to be the, the responsible for the, mer for the death of somebody else and all his descendants? Jail is not a biblical concept. There, were, there are no jails in the Bible. Every man is, was given the possibility to study Torah, to correct his ways for improvement. The root of the word miklat, refuge, also means absorption and integration. 
Only a total immersion in the Torah can allow us to escape from spiritual and physical death by in-depth teachings of his ways. And the death, the death of the, the great sacrificator provided atonement for the culprit and he could return then to his inheritance. As we have seen in previous parashot, the contact with death brings separation between man and God because it is, we are talking here about the ritual impurity of death. It's not impurity has to do with death and life. So the leper, if we recall the parasha Metzora, so I, I encourage you to watch those videos, the Metzora had to, had to be declared clean only also by the sacrificator. So what does it mean? It means that the shadow of Messiah is visible in this exchange between life and death. As the great sacrificator, he gave his life so that we could re-enter the divine presence as in the beginning. And in Romans 5, 9 it says, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For him, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. The Talmud said that at biblical time, there were signs to indicate city of refuges. Each sign has a double inscription, Miklat, Miklat. And the numerical value of the word Miklat is 179. When it is doubled, it makes 358. That is the numerical value of the word Messiah, Mashiach. The purpose and the goal, the aim of the Torah is Messiah, is their refuge, who paid with his blood to redeem our sins and to those of the whole world. In him can only the death penalty be abolished for culprits because he atoned for bloodshed by shedding his own blood, is the purpose of the Torah. For Messiah, in Romans 10, is, is, it's written for Messiah is the end. This is not true. Messiah, it means, is the goal. For the goal at which the Torah aims is the Messiah who offers righteousness to everyone who trusts. So he had to die to redeem the people in exile, of the exile due to their sin of idolatry. The sinner had to die, Yeshua willingly accepted to take his place. And the culprit had to study Torah in the city of refuge. And this is a prophetic foreshadowing of the word that is one more time announced in the same passage that we started to read in Deuteronomy 30. For this commandment, mitzvah, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you, nor is far from off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it? Nor it is beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear and do it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. And this passage becomes even more meaningful in the light of what it's we can read in Romans 10, 4-9. For Messiah is the purpose of the, of the Torah, for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes that the man who practice righteousness, which is based on the Torah, shall live by righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven? Even this Hebrew verse contains the name of God and an allusion to the circumcision of the heart. That is to bring the Messiah down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Messiah from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith. So the word of faith is the mitzvah. It's the, it's the, um, the word is near, near you, in your mouth and in your heart. The verse from Deuteronomy. If you confess with your mouth Yeshua as Lord and believe in your heart that he has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So there is this midrashic parallel that Paul is doing with comparing the commandments to the Messiah and the word of God. So Yeshua came down, he came to, to help us to understand, to put into practice this Torah. He put himself within reach for us to be able to learn, to practice, to love, and to learn what he is about God. And we, it is in him that we can carry is the yoke of the Torah that is light Torah. 
He established a parallel between the seas and the abyss because at the time we, when you would be traveling on sea, it's like you were not coming back. It was death. He is the suffering Messiah Ben Yosef and he is the King Messiah Ben David. He will gather miraculously his people, sanctified to serve with him on his holy mountain. And then the book of Numbers ends with the appearance of the daughter of Tselofchad, who obtained their father's inheritance in the land of Israel, but now they had to get married in their own tribe in order not to lose the Yosef heritage, which is, I'll send you back to the previous parasha, which is a prophetic foot on the Holy Land in order for Ephraim to come back. So there's also an interesting interpretation that explained that the book of Numbers is linked to Genesis. There were 10 generations from Adam to Noah, 10 from Noah to Terah, 10 from Abraham to the Tselofrat daughters. The end of the journeys of the chosen people is then linked, associated to the creation, like it is a return to the original perfection by the entrance to the promised land with, by the 12 tribes. A new generation, a remnant, cleans of the house of Judah and Ephraim, Yosef, is about to enter the promised land and each tribe will keep their heritage. Messiah, the banner of Hashem, will gather the exile of the house of Judah and of the house of Ephraim and bring them back into the promised land. In Isaiah 11:12, we can read, He will set up a banner, Ness, it's a miracle, Ness is a miracle, for the nations, and he will assemble the outcast of Israel, and this is Ephraim, and gather together this person of Judah, this is Judah, from the four corners of the earth. This is Matthew, Matthew 24. And then the mystery will be fulfilled. The tabernacle of David, the Sukkot David, will be restored. We can read in Revelation 11.25, For I do not desire, but friend, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Let's bring back our brothers from Ephraim. And Revelation 10.7, it says, But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, which is about to sound, the mystery of God shall, will be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Each tribe has its characteristics, its calling, its place in the kingdom of God, who brings back every man and woman to their heritage in the house of Israel and of Judah to establish his temple. Each one is called to become a living stone that must build this heavenly temple. Each one has a place and calling, everyone has a place in the kingdom. If their stone has not been carved by the iron of men, so let the purity of the Torah purify our conceptions through the Spirit. And let's end by the Zohar. It tells us the purpose of the desert passage and the 42 steps was to enable the Israelites to seek out isolated sparks of holiness and free them from their captivity. These sparks have been captured by the clipot one more time, the spiritual negative forces that are taking up residence in the desert. God had the Israelites travel through such places so that their holiness would act like a magnet and attract these lost sparks of holiness. He wants us to become magnet to attract the lost tribes and people of God. And the 12 tribes correspond also to 12 tribes of prayer. 12 heavenly gates correspond to the 12 tribes each one has its own form of prayer that rises to God through these gates. Already we can see that intercession springs out of the hearts of the cleansed remnant, longing to, for the perfect grafting back in the olive tree of Israel, whose root is Messiah. There's not two trees, there's only one tree is the olive tree. Everybody is coming back to Israel. And soon the heavenly shofar will resound and together from the ends of the earth, like in Deuteronomy, we will enter to the gates of Jerusalem who bear the names of the 12 tribes. So, Amen, may it be soon. Thank you for listening. I encourage you to share videos, to register to the class. You can become a member to support this ministry and benefit from different classes. Visit our website, sukkadavid.com. 
Thank you very much. And as we say at each end of book, of the book of the Torah, we say, Chazek, Chazek, Venit Chazek. Be strong, be strong, and may be made stronger in the study of the Torah in Yeshua. Shalom, and thank you very much.